Well, God bless you. Good evening and welcome to another Wednesday edition of Wednesday in the Word on the Web, the virtual Bible class of Greater St. John Missionary Baptist Church. We're located at 101 North Adams Street, South Bend, Indiana, 46628, where yours truly, Andre A. McGee, is pastor teacher. We are the church committed to explaining the Bible for the equipment of the believer, the evangelist of the blind, and the edifying of the body as we endeavor to bond in the unity of the spirit. We're so grateful to God that you have chosen to be with us today to share in this wonderful time of feasting in the word of God. I hope and pray that as we go through this process tonight, that you'll be enrichly edified as we study God's word together. I love the word of God, don't you? The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to divide the sun of soul and spirit of the joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thought and intent of the heart. The word of God should be hid in our hearts that we will not sin against him because the word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so tonight we present to you the inspired, the inerrant, the infallible, the indestructible word of God. We want to also invite you to worship with us on Sundays at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can certainly worship with us virtually or you can worship with us visibly. If you desire to worship with us virtually, you certainly can continue to tune in to our Facebook page at Greater St. John Missionary Baptist Church, South Bend, or you can certainly seek and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Greater St. John MBC South Bend. Uh, we also invite you to certainly work, worship with us on the grounds at 101 North Adams Street. If you happen to live in the Michiana area, you certainly can listen to us on WG, uh, WUBS 89.7 FM, the real family station. We look forward to you being a part of our experience. Will you do me a favor tonight? Will you tag, text, and tell someone, let them know that we're online? Yes, it's been about a couple of months since we've been here, but we are back and we're grateful to God for the opportunity to continue our journey through the gospel of John. So you tag, text, and tell someone, let them know that we're online, like, love, share this stream with your family, your friends, even your foes, that they too may be a part of this fellowship. We will be so greatly indebted to you. Well, as I aforementioned, uh, we have we've started our Bible study back today. We had a noonday earlier today from 1145 to 1245. Uh, and tonight it is our hope to have an in-person session, even as we broadcast right now. And so we look forward to you being a part of that if you want to in person. But we also want to continue to keep this live stream, this virtual feed uh, alive for those who cannot make it to the building. And of course, those who don't even live in the area, but have been following us throughout the last three to four years, and you want to continue to do so. We appreciate you so much, and we actually will continue to keep us in your prayers. Amen. So let's say, uh, let's talk to God for a moment. Let's ask God's presence upon what we're about to do, and let's proceed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, again for a fresh and a new for the manifold blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Thank you for your amazing grace, your everyday mercies, your joy unspeakable, your peace that surpasses all understanding, your unconditional love. We thank you that you are with us each and every day. We thank you that if it had not been for you on our side, we don't know what we would be. We thank you that it's because of your grace and your mercy that we have not been consumed because your compassion do not fail they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And we ask tonight as we open the book that your Holy Spirit will give us clarity, understanding as to what you are communicating to us, and then empower us to put it into practice that you might receive glory. We pray you give strength to the saved, salvation to the sinner. But most of all, we pray that your name will be glorified. We know that when your name is glorified, your presence is magnified, your power is ratified. The unsaved are notified, the believer's faith is justified, and the devil is horrified. Have your way in our midst, and we'll be careful to give your name praise in the strong, sweet, and saving name of Jesus, who is the Christ, we pray. Thank God. Amen and amen. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you have your Bibles handy. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 11. And we're going to look at uh, 
verses 1 through 16 tonight. We are in lesson 12 uh, of the lesson that we've been studying. In fact, uh, the, the book that we're using is Journey into Knowing Jesus, a study of the Gospel of John by Tommy C. Higgle. We are in lesson number 12, which is titled Experiencing Resurrection Power. Experiencing Resurrection Power. And the scripture reference is John chapter 11, verses 1 through 57. That's right. John chapter 11, verse 1 through 57. But tonight we want to look at um, experiencing Jesus' resurrection power has three requirements. And of the three, we want to talk about only one of them tonight. We're trying our best to keep in tune and keep on pace with our in-person classes and so we're going to only look at the first 16 verses of John chapter 11 tonight. And the first, of course, of those requirements is anticipate things you can't understand. That's verses 1 through 16. Now, getting back to the title of today's lesson, Experiencing Resurrection Power, Experiencing Resurrection Power, we need resurrection power to be on full display in the life of every believer. Uh, we need supernatural power because it is only through supernatural power, and that's the kind of power that is being expressed and explained here when we talk about resurrection power. We need resurrection power to change what we cannot of ourselves. Many of us are confronted with attitudes, habits, bitterness, etc. And in order for us to change those very things, we need supernatural power to do so. The fact that we need supernatural power to do so implies that we cannot do it in and of ourselves, that we are weak, feeble, uh, inept when it comes to changing things on our own. It takes a power that is greater than we. And so when we talk about the power, the resurrection power of Jesus, because Jesus does say in this chapter that I am the resurrection and the life. He that believe in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that believes in me shall never die. And so the resurrection power of Jesus is on full display. Thus far, Jesus has already shared with us a few other I am sayings in the gospel of John. He's told us that he is the living water, that he is the bread of life, that he's the light of the world, that he's the door to the sheepfold, that he's the good shepherd. Uh, and so we know that, uh, and even he's going to tell us later on that he's the way, the truth, and the life. But in this chapter, he's want us to understand that he is the resurrection and the life. Uh, which demonstrates his awesome power. And of course, when you talk about power, the power of God, the dunamis power of God, uh, we know that that power is sufficient to change circumstances and situations for our good and for God's glory. Many of us are familiar with this particular passage Tonight, if you've been in church any length of time, you've heard about Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and Jesus. You've heard the account about Lazarus being sick and ultimately dying. You've heard how his sisters sent for Jesus to come uh, to his bedside in order that a miracle might be performed. Uh, we also know that Jesus uh, decided not to come right away, but that he waited a couple more days before he even made an attempt to make his way back to town. And when he got back to town, we are familiar with the dialogue that took place between he and Mary and he and Martha. Uh, we're familiar with what he said at the sepulcher of Lazarus and the fact that he wept at that sepulcher. We are so aware but a lot of times our familiarity with this passage robs us of some nuggets that may have been there the whole time, but we just not did not look at them. And so hopefully tonight, as we take our time and go through this lesson, we'll be able to stumble over some of those things for you to consider. 
All right. So but before we start tonight, I do want us to at least look at the first 16 uh, verses of this particular uh, chapter tonight. Amen. Look at the first 16 verses of this chapter tonight. All right. And so if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with us to Luke to John chapter 11, verse one through 16. If you don't have a Bible handy, then we'll read those verses here on the screen for you. All right. John chapter 11, verse one says, now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister, Martha. It was that Mary, which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Verse three, therefore his sisters sent unto him saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Verse four, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the son of God might be glorified thereby. Verse five and six. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Verse six, when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Verse seven and eight. Then after that, said he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goeth thou thither again? Verse 9, Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? We know that in the Jewish calendar, they went from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. Verse 11, these things said he, and after that he said unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Verses 12 and 13, then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Verse number 14 and 15. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. And finally, verse 16 for the night. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Amen. That we might die with him. All right. Okay. So those are the verses for tonight. And as I aforementioned, we are looking at the first part of our lesson. As we talk about experiencing Jesus's re resurrection power and what it requires. There are three requirements in all within this lesson. But tonight, we're going to just look at the first one. And the first one simply is this. Anticipate things you can't understand. Anticipate things you can't understand. It's on page 55 of your book if you have it at your disposal. If you notice there on page 55, uh, we talk about the chapter opens up telling us that Jesus's dear friend Lazarus is very ill. And we know that that was the nature of the relationship that Jesus had with him because, well, with that, there are several clues. Number one, when the woman, when the women, his sisters, Mary and Martha, sent word to Jesus telling him, behold, the one whom thou lovest is sick. And now, usually when we see the word love in the New Testament, we automatically assume that it is the word agape or agapeo. But that is not the word that is used here. And I may have erred in saying so earlier, so I want to correct that now. Because this particular word is the word fellows. And what that basically means is that Jesus had such love for him that he loved him as a friend. In fact, later on in this same passage, we know that Jesus, in talking to his disciples on the side of the Jordan where they were, basically said, to them that our friend is dead and I got to go raise him up. 
And by referring to him as friend, he was basically saying that not only is he a good friend of mine, but he's a good friend of ours. Uh, the reason we know that Jesus loves him as a friend is because Jesus had spent time in the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus on several occasions. He did that whenever he was around Jerusalem. Bethany was said to be about two miles east of Jerusalem. And so Jesus oftentimes would uh, make his abode there in, in Bethany. Bethany was a small town, which was located about two miles, as I said, about 15 furlongs um, east of Jerusalem on the hillside of Mount Olivet. And though it was a small town, uh, it really became famous because of its reception of Christ. The fact that Jesus could find comfort and find a welcoming presence there at the home that was shared by the two sisters and their brother. In fact, scripture records that Jesus visited the home of Mary and Martha uh, in John in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Uh, it was here in the city of Bethany that Jesus would ultimately raise Lazarus from the dead. It is here uh, that he was being feeded at a supper in John chapter 12. Uh, it was here that J J uh, Lazarus' sister Mary anointed Jesus' feet with an alabaster flask of ointment and wiped it with her hair. Uh, it was here that Jesus would lodge instead of Jerusalem when ministering in Jerusalem during the day. And it was here near where Jesus would ascend after his death, burial, uh, uh, and resurrection. And so Jesus spent some time there in Bethany, and he had a love for Lazarus. Uh, we know that his love was not just phelos, but it was also agapeo. And we know that as we go in the lesson, and we read the verses earlier, what the Bible says, and Jesus loved Mary Martha and their brother Lazarus. And that particular word is agapeo. So he had both a selfless, sacrificial, uh, unconditional love for Lazarus, but he also had the love for him as a friend. They were friendly toward him and he was friendly toward them. And so when you look at this passage, uh, it opens with Lazarus being sick. And when you read the text closely, uh, he is not just sick, he is deathly ill. Uh, this sickness that he is experiencing is going to lead to his physical death. Uh, and uh, it, it, it appears that whenever Jesus would visit, it, visit Jerusalem, he would spend the time there. And so because of that relationship, uh, these women send word uh, and in, in, in 11, chapter 11, verse 3b, he says to them, and I want you to write that portion on the first part of your line. He says, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. I want you to write that on line. Behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. All right. And of course, as I aforementioned, that word lovest or love is the word fellows. In other words, your good friend is sick, right? Amen. Uh, uh, the one that you love is sick. Now, notice that when they sent this message, they did not say your good friend that loves you is sick. They said he whom thou lovest is sick. In other words, they're making a request on behalf of Lazarus but not on the basis of his love for Jesus, but rather Jesus' love for him. And so they're doing what we ought to do whenever we're faced with a crisis, whenever we're faced with a tragedy, whenever we're faced with pain, uh, whenever we're dealing with sickness or death, is understand that the right person to go to is Jesus. But when you go to Jesus, you ought not go to Jesus on the basis of your love for him, but rather his love for you. Does that make sense to anybody? And so we see that. So I hope you wrote on that first line, 
what they said. They said, behold, they said, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. All right. So when Jesus received this news, he's on the east side of Jordan, about a day's journey, 20 miles from Bethany. Uh, Mary and Martha both know that Jesus deeply loves them. And based upon that, there might have been an expectancy on their part that the moment Jesus gets this message, he would drop what he was doing and come and see them. But when we look at verse number six, we discover that Jesus waits two days. And in the meantime, Lazarus dies before he even gets back to town. It is safe to assume that Lazarus died probably sometime between the departure of the messengers and the arrival of the messengers. They were going to let Jesus know that his dear friend is sick. Now, of course, you and I both know that Jesus did not need the messengers to inform him that Lazarus was sick, let alone that he had died. In fact, the messengers, all they knew was that he was sick. They didn't even know he died because they were already gone. And so Jesus knew this. He knew this. And yet he decides to stay where he is a couple of more days because he is looking to do something here that will further glorify God and further glorify himself. And in addition to that, will strengthen the faith of his disciples as well as the faith of Mary and Martha. That's really what we see happening here. We need to remember this incident when God doesn't immediately uh, answer our desperate prayers as we desire. And we see here that Jesus did not respond right away. And it's hard for many of us to reconcile these two points in our mind. The fact that Jesus loves Lazarus, that he loves Mary, that he loves Martha. And yet when he receives word that Lazarus is sick, that he is deathly ill, Jesus does not respond right away. Now, there are several ways he could have responded. He could have gotten back and basically touched Lazarus and healed him on the spot or even raised him on the spot. He could have just said the word because we know that he's done that before with his miracles, uh, with the nobleman's son. He could, he could have done that. Uh, but rather than do any of that, Jesus decides to wait two more days before he would even dare respond. And many times we struggle with that. We, we struggle with asking the Lord to do something on our behalf only for him to take his sweet time. We want God to, rem to, to move fast, to move at a pace that satisfies us. And when he does not move when we think he should, it, 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 cre it creates a crisis of belief in many of our minds. Uh, Jesus, but when we have these instances, I want you to underline in your book, we need to remember that God doesn't immediately answer our desperate prayers as we desire. Uh, maybe a loved one is suffering from a fatal disease, or maybe uh, we are experiencing financial reverses, or maybe we are experiencing marital problems, or maybe there is um, cat catastrophe on the job, or maybe our money is funny, our change is strange, or maybe... Our families are torn apart and in shambles or all of these different things are happening. And we go to God in prayer, in believing prayer, asking him to intervene, asking him to intercede, asking him to work a miracle, ask him to right the wrongs and to set in order that which is chaotic, only for Jesus to not respond when we think and so after we then prayed and took the problem to him, the loved one still dies or uh, the finances don't improve or the marriage ends in divorce or the job lays you off or 
your family abandons and deserts you or your friends run off and leave you, so forth and so on. Because you prayed and asked God to move, but God did not move as soon as you thought he should. The old saint would say, he may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. And we often add, he may not come when you want him, but you will want him when he comes. Because Jesus has a way of showing up when the time is right. And the time may not always be in sync with what we think should be happening. And so we see this happening here in this particular passage. And so we pray and things don't happen. But does that mean that God does not love us? Does that mean that God does not want what's best for us? Does that mean that God wants us to to be uh, weeping and, and worried and fretting? No. In fact, there's a passage of scripture in John chapter 13, verse 7, that you want to write on the line that we ought to remember when these things happen. I'm going to read it to you from the uh, New King James Version, which says this, and I want you to write it on the line. I'll repeat it for you. Jesus answered and said to them, what I am doing, what I am doing, you do not understand now. What I am doing, you do not understand now. I hope you're writing this down, all right? What I am doing, you do not understand now. This is John chapter 13, verse 7. You can also look it up if you desire. I forgot to put it on my slide, so I don't have it on the screen. But John 13, verse 7 says, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. What I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Amen. And so it's important that we remember, brothers and sisters, that Jesus may not move as soon as we think he should. But it doesn't mean he doesn't love us. It just means he has a greater plan in mind. And so we will understand it better down the road. Amen. I like it. Uh, when you think about the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John was written for the express purpose and the specific intent of developing faith in us for Jesus. And, and of course, when you circle the word believe in the Gospel of John, you probably would have a snag or two book because it's everywhere. The objective is for us to believe on him. And so when you believe on him, great things happen, even if you have to wait. So John 13, verse 7 is on that second blank space on your page. Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. All right. God wants us to know how much Jesus loved Lazarus and his sisters. Jesus didn't immediately respond to Mary and Martha's request, not because he didn't love them, but because, as I aforementioned, he had a plan that they would, under, they would not understand until later. In fact, uh, we're going to find out mo in a moment that Lazarus' illness was for the purpose of glorifying the Father, glorifying the Son, and also for the purpose of developing the faith of his pupils, namely his disciples and his peers, Mary, or his friends, Mary and Martha, and of course, Lazarus. And so we see that happening here. Don't let, and so, and so because he did not respond immediately, doesn't mean that he doesn't love them. It just means that he has a greater plan that they will understand later. And so there's a there's a note here I want you to underline in your book, and I want to share with you who don't have it. Don't let your confidence in God's love be shaken when he fails to answer your prayers the way you expect. Don't let your confidence in God or confidence in God's love be shaken when he fails to answer your prayers the way you expect. Uh, that, that's a good point for us to pause because it's. I think it needs to be said that just because God loves us doesn't mean we won't experience sickness. Doesn't mean we won't experience pain. Doesn't mean we won't experience death. 
Uh, doesn't mean we won't experience hardship. Doesn't mean the sky won't turn gray. The rain won't fall. When you love God, when God loves you, that means that these things will happen also, right? It happened to Mary and Martha. They, they lost their brother. He got sick and died. They sent for Jesus. Jesus didn't return right away. They do. He could have, but he did not. And we will learn later that they had a, a, an ax to grind with him about that. Right. Uh, and so these things happen. But just because we experience delayed response from God doesn't mean he loves us any less. Uh, and so we are not allowed that to shake our confidence when it comes to uh, his plan. Sometimes God allows things to happen. We just can't understand at the time. Now, if you, I challenged the class earlier. Now, if you run into somebody who tells you that they understand everything that God is doing all the time, run for your life. Because that person is lying through their teeth. Doesn't matter how close you are to God. Doesn't matter how close he is to you. Doesn't matter how long you've been walking with God. Doesn't matter how much faith you have in God. There will come a time in your life where that very faith will waver, where that very faith will weaken, where that very faith will be wanting. And you need the Lord to reassure you that he has not abandoned you or forgotten about you. Amen. And so we need to keep that in mind as we look at this. And so uh, don't let your confidence be shaken when it comes to God's love, when he doesn't answer in the way that you expect, because sometimes God allows things to happen that we just can't understand at the time. And so we just have to continue to hold on to what he has already promised us. However, God has a divine purpose for every problem he allows. That's a great statement there. He has a divine purpose for every problem he allows. Now, it doesn't say that God is responsible or that he is to blame for all of the problems that we have. It does say that in his sovereign power and provision, he allows certain things to happen even though they have happened, God still has a divine purpose hidden within that process. There's a there's there's a plan, right? Um, earlier today, I brought up the passage that a lot of us like to quote in Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of good and not of evil to give you a hope and a future. And many of us quote that passage and many of us uh, tout it as one of our favorite passages of scripture but we don't always understand the context in which it was written. This was written to people who were in Babylonian captivity. These were people who were sentenced to 70 years there. False prophets had risen and basically gave them false hope that somehow their time in Babylon had come to an end, was about to come to an end, and that they were going to go home. And God sent his prophets and said, no, 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 that ain't. That ain't what I said. You're going to be here for 70 years. You might well sit down and relax. You might well uh, get married, have some children, uh, raise some crops, right? You know, uh, build some houses, pray for the city, right? Because you're going to be here. Because I know the thoughts that I have for you. I know the plans that I have for you. At my appointed time, I'm going to move you from where you are to where you desire to be or where I want you to be. Amen. And so many times we don't always understand why God allows certain things to happen. But when we get down the road of peace, then we're able to reflect on certain experiences and that light comes on and say, oh, I know now, I understand now why I had to go through what I'm going through, why I had to experience what I'm experiencing because God was in control the whole time, even though I did not understand, even though I could not fathom, even though I could not uh, comprehend, I could not uh, put it together. I could not make sense of it to save my life. But because God is in control and that he's sovereign and he knows what he's doing, because God 
is all powerful. He had a plan the whole time. And now as a result of it, I'm made the better. My dependence upon him has increased and my faith in him is that much deeper. And so God allows these problems. Now, what was the reason for him allowing Lazarus to be ill? Well, we see that in verse four, and I want to pull that back up for us. Uh, verse four says, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death. Even though he died, it was not unto death, but for the glory of God, and that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. All right? So this sickness that Lazarus experienced was not because of his sin. It was not because of some disease particularly. This sickness is not under death, but it was for the glory of God, and that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. You see that God has a purpose, right? And so that's why God in Christ decided to wait two days before he even told his disciples, hey, y'all, let's go back to Judea. All right. They could understand uh, why he want to go back there, because the last time they were there, the leaders were in a stony mood. They were looking to stone him, to kill him, right? You know, you read that whole dialogue. He told them, hey, man, I need to go. Lazarus is sick. Uh, I got to go wake him. Well, if he's asleep, uh, then uh, he's doing pretty good. He's going to get better. No, y'all don't understand. Uh, I got to go wake him because he's dead, right? And, uh, and so in, in wrestling with all of this, we see that Jesus is seeking to not only glorify himself and glorify his father, but also increase the faith of his disciples who have been with him. Uh, and so in response, what does Jesus say in, in, in John chapter 11, verse 11b? Uh, he says to them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. See that? Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. That's what you want around your line. Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Right? That's what Jesus said initially, right? He says, Lazarus is asleep. I need to go wake him. Sleep being a euphemism for death in scripture. If someone is sleeping, what eventually happened? They'll wake up, right? And so what Jesus was saying to his disciples is, Lazarus is dead. I'm going to raise him. That's amazing to me. That, that, that's amazing that he's going to do that. So uh, the B portion, what you want to put in your line there on page 56 at the top, our friend Lazarus sleep it, but I go, here it is, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. He's about to demonstrate that not only does he have a power over disease, but he has power over death, right? He's going to introduce them to the fact that not only am I the living water, not only am I the bread of life, not only am I the good shepherd, not only am I the door to the sheepfold, not only uh, am I all of that, but I am the resurrection and the life. Right. We're going to see that later on in chapter 11. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that lives and believes in me shall never die. And so he says to his disciples, I'm going because Lazarus is dead and I've got to get him up. For a believer, death is falling asleep in one place and waking up in another. And so it's interesting here is that once he shares this with his disciples and they understand, even though they said when he had first brought it up, 
that he's going back to Judea. Hey, man, listen, them folk trying to kill you. You think they have aborted their mission? They are looking to kill you. And yet, even though Jesus had this conversation with them, you could still hear them saying, and it's right there. If you didn't turn your Bible open, close, or you turn, tear, out, tear out your Bible, is that all they heard was, well, Thomas was called Didymus, say, hey, man, listen, we might as well go on with him and die with him. Now, before you rush the judgment on Thomas, I think it's interesting that Thomas demonstrated some faith, even though it wasn't complete. I mean, 